when it's deployed in a medical device that has you know, life safety and other therapeutic functions. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what you need to think about when you're using Linux or other open source software in a medical device. And when we talk about the things to consider that go into a medical device, we talk about risk. So we're gonna to talk today about reducing the risk of using Linux in a medical device. So we'll start a little bit by talking about what does the medical industry consider to be risk management and software. And we'll talk a little bit about a concept called soup, which I'll go into some detail. And then we'll talk about, well, what does that mean when you're selecting an operating system? And then we'll go into talking about some other considerations about licensing, data privacy, cybersecurity, and managing a Linux distribution. And hopefully at the end of all this, you'll have a little bit better of an understanding as to what it means to want to use open source software in a medical device and the things that you need to think about. So let's talk first about medical risk management. You know, what is it? You know, what does the medical community think about risk? Well, it's a pretty standard concept across many industries. And, and, and from the beginning, it looks very similar in the medical industry. You know, risk is a combination of the probability of occurrence of a harm and the severity of the harm. So if you have something that is unlikely to occur, then the severity is considered, can be considered worse um, because it's very unlikely to occur. And we'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. You know, and then risk management is basically, you know, your policies, your procedures, your practices to evaluate those risks, understanding their severity, and then controlling the risks and monitoring them. And the goal of risk management is to identify and control those risks to an acceptable level. An acceptable level is an interesting term because it's not really defined. Um, and the reason that it's not defined is that the acceptable level only can be considered in context of the device. So if your device is, you know, relatively benign in concept, you know, like a, a, a testing device, then you really don't want to have, you know, some kind of medical test be likely to cause a patient harm. And so acceptable risk would be very, very stringent because the harm would, would outweigh the benefit. Whereas if your medical device is, you know, a, a surgical robot that, you know, is, is going to um, hopefully improve the likelihood of patient survival over and above where they started, then perhaps your definition of acceptable risk is a little scarier because once again, the benefit is much greater than the potential harm. And when we talk about acceptable risk, that's really what we're talking about, is the benefit greater than the uh, potential harm. And risk management is used in many, many industries. Um, it is part and parcel of the medical device industry. You can't do anything in medical devices without thinking about it. So we've all, you know, if, if you've been involved in risk management, you've all sit around a table with a bunch of really bright people um, and have talked about risks and how to manage them and all of that. And it always goes down to some really unlikely thing that happened. And, 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 and a lot of time is spent, you know, don't do that. Um, I think this, this comic just comes pretty close to home for me because I've been in several of these. Anyway. So what is, you know, we talk about risk management in medical devices. Well, what do we have to do? Well, there's a standard ISO, ISO 14971, which is all about risk management in medical devices. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about ISO 14971. Uh, you, can, you can do that on your own time. But it does require a device manufacturer to define a risk management process that looks for the hazards, estimates the risks, controls the risks, and then monitors the effectiveness of the risk control measures. And then a big thing about it is that the risks aren't just things that might come from the intended use of the device, but for what they call reasonably foreseeable misuse. And so if you can consider in your device ways that it could be misused that can cause harm, 
then you need to consider how to minimize those risks in the design and the development of the device. And there are many ways to do that, but you can't just say, oh, no, you, they're not supposed to do that, so it doesn't matter. Okay, And then you need to document everything you do and maintain that in something that's called a risk management file, which is actually not a file anymore. It ends up being a bunch of documents that are part of the submission that you make to your regulators before your device can be approved. So the key points basically are what we've been talking about. All realistic risks must be considered and mitigated to an acceptable level. This is not really defined, but you need to be able to justify your decisions about risk because your regulator is going to ask about it, your lawyers are going to ask about it, and by God, if something goes wrong, the courts are going to ask about it. And this is not just true for software developed by you, the person who's making the device, but all third-party software that you might use as well. So let's talk about that third-party software in, in a concept called SOUP. So SOUP is an acronym called Software of Unknown Providence. It's one of my favorite concepts in safety software because it basically says, you know, I've got software, it's generally available. It wasn't really developed for the purpose of being used in a medical device and adequate documentation of the development standards are not available. Now that's actually a very kind of key point there because adequate documentation basically means was the software designed and developed to a safety standard like IEC 62304 or um, IEC 61508 or ISO 26262. There are a bunch of them out there, right? So, so it doesn't mean that documentation of the developed standards, development standards does not exist, just that they don't map to a safety standard like 62304. And SOUP can either be commercial or open source software. And in, in, my, in my role as, as a safety officer for Siemens Embedded, you know, I work with both open source and commercial software, and, and we handle them differently. But the idea is the same. And then if SOUP is to be used in a medical device, it must be considered throughout the life cycle of the device. So when we talk about SOUP, Right? What are some of the considerations that we have um, you know, for SOUP? Well, you know, SOUP has to adhere to the same risk management processes as the rest of the software on the device. So if the SOUP might fail in such a way that can cause harm, then the, the, then, then the risk of that software failing that caused the harm needs to be mitigated. Right? And there are lots of ways to do it. But you need to think about those things. And, and it will depend upon several factors, right? How is it used? You know, how is the soup used? What will happen if it fails? How robust is it, right? You know, if you have something that's pretty robust that's been deployed in millions and millions and millions of devices, then, then that is, you know, that is a, a key consideration when you're deciding to use soup in your device. So something like Linux might be known to be more robust than say, you know, a, a two-person graduate student project that was abandoned 10 years ago, but is still out there in GitHub and might be useful, right? Um, you know, how are, they de how are defects managed in the soup and how will it be updated? How will obsolescence be managed? All of these things are required to be considered if you're gonna use soup in your device. And then when you decide to use soup, the developer should consider those and other factors. And this is true no matter what the soup is. So what other things do you need to think about? Well, regulators are, are looking more and more for a lot of information about any open source software you're using your device. And this kind of goes beyond the soup requirements that were mentioned on the last slide. You know, some things that they may, may might look for, right? You know, how do you know that the development process for the open source software is high quality? Right? It's not just, oh, it doesn't fail in the field. It's got to be something that you can kind of look at and point to and say, yes, indeed, this is high quality. How active is the community? How do they manage defects, especially security defects? The, uh, uh, the FDA in America and, and regulators around the world are very focused on security in medical devices. 
you know, what are you going to, how are you going to manage updates of those open source modules that you use, right? What is the maintenance policy of your open source modules? How long will the version that you use be maintained? And if, if you want to continue to use a, a version of open source that is no longer being actively maintained by the community, um, then how are you going to manage CVEs and defects for your modules uh, in the future? So those are all things you need to consider. So let's go back a minute and talk about, okay, how do I come to the decision of to use an operating system in a medical device? It is in some sense similar to the decision that you make to use an operating system in any embedded device, but it's, it's a little more important to consider because of the regulatory approval that must ultimately be made. So there are a lot of considerations, and I could have listed these considerations in any order possible, and I'm not even going to talk about them. But you need to kind of say, for my device, right, what's most important? Right, like if I'm making, say, a, uh, a, 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 an MRI scanner, right, I probably am going to, you know, have enough RAM and ROM and whatever that, that, that it doesn't really matter, right, what, the, what the, the ROM size and the RAM size of the operating system is going to be. Whereas if I have a very small device, it may be a huge consideration. So it's all, all in context. But will my, and, and, if, and if, if my context is small, well, will my design fit? Because a lot of people, when they think of Linux, think about, say, a desktop, right? Where you've got, you know, eight gigabyte of RAM or more, and you've got all of this room, and you've got a hard drive that can host everything. You know, and, 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 and really, at the end of the day, right, no embedded medical device is going to look like that. Because at the end of the day, you want those things to be small with a small bomb cost. So you need to kind of think about, will I be able to fit my design onto um, my device based on the operating system I'm using? And I might want to use an RTOS, a real-time operating system. It'll always be smaller than Linux, but it will not be nearly as functional. But you can also optimize embedded Linux uh, smaller than you probably think, um, unless you've got experience optimizing embedded Linux. Um, you know, we've taken one of our Linux products down to less than 32 megabytes to have a, a, a bootable, usable system. It doesn't have a lot to it, but it may be enough for what you need. Do you have real-time requirements, right? I mean, real-time isn't really fast. Fast is what Linux is really, really good at, right? Uh, but it's more marked by the impact of what happens if a deadline is not met, right? You know, a point of sale terminal or, or something like that's not real time, right? Doesn't matter if it takes, you know, five, five milliseconds or 50 milliseconds for something to go through. Whereas like an autopilot or a, 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 a robotic, uh, uh, surgical device, right? Those are real time, right? If I delay on acting on a changing input, the, re the result can be catastrophic. And so the real question then comes to what kind of real time am I dealing with? If I have no real time, subjective scheduling deadlines kind of depends upon what's going on, then I don't need to worry about it. I can use Linux, I'm happy. If I have soft real time, you know, if my system can handle a few missed deadlines and a lot of systems, a lot of safety critical systems can handle a few missed deadlines, then I'm perfectly fine. I can use preempt RT, I'm good to go. But if I have hard, hard real time where I can never ever miss a deadline, then I need to think real hard about the use of Linux or other, of, of Linux especially uh, in that system. And then here's a little bit just about preempt RT. You probably are already aware of this, uh, but preempt RT actually brings Linux much, much closer to that real time goal that we were talking about that our tosses are well known for. So let's move from there. You know, so let's say you've gone through all of that. You go, yes, indeed, I can use Linux. It's going to fit on my device. I can take advantage of all of the rich capabilities that Linux and other modules bring on. Let's talk a little bit about data, data privacy. You know, and the challenge is really, you know, how can I deliver devices that support innovative therapies and treatments while protecting user confidential data, device security, and caregiver networks? Right, so basically in the US, you deliver to the FDA 
a 510K pre-market submission uh, that basically then is reviewed by the regulator to determine whether you can net, or you, whether you can market your device. And you must address security if you have network connectivity. Now, the FDA gives guidance on cybersecurity for both pre- and post-market, and then most of the rest of the world mandates similar requirements. So making device secure requires consideration throughout the life cycle, right? You need to kind of think about it from the beginning, when you're designing and developing the system, to when it's deployed, to when it's decommissioned, right? But many of the considerations come up front, right? How are you gonna protect the device against issues that are known before the release, right? If you're using software, uh, especially from the open source, but even if you're using commercial software, if you're writing it all yourself, issues will be found while you're developing it. So how are you gonna manage those issues um, that you become aware of before you release? How are you gonna protect against issues that come up later, right? If you're using, especially if you're using um, um, commercial or open source software, issues are found all the time. Um, and they aren't all known at the time you re release your product. And so you need to kind of consider what you're gonna do about it, right? And then you'd also need to think about how you're gonna make it difficult to exploit the device after release, because the device has a lot of data on it that would be damaging if it was put out into the public and you would be subject to HIPAA and other violations. You know, data privacy is a huge deal in the medical world today. You know, in 2015, KPMG looked at this and said, 80% of health plans and healthcare providers acknowledged that patient data had been compromised. And even in 2015, there was a lot of cyber related investments that have been made. So you would think, well, between 2015 and today, things have gotten so much better. Well, the Department of Health and Human Services office showed 686 data, care, data breaches of 500 or more records just in 2021, right? Just last year. And that was almost 45 million healthcare records were exposed or stolen, which made 2021 the second worst year in terms of breached healthcare records. Well, you know, eh, we didn't have that much to do in 2021, so people got interested in things. No, no. This data is valuable. It's valuable to the bad guys. And, and your device needs to protect that data to the greatest extent possible. Because HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act requires it, as do laws and regulations around the world, such as the GDPR and the EU, which if anything is even more stringent than HIPAA. So there are a number of considerations that you need to think about, right? You know, you have access control, right? You know, have you considered the various role your device supports? And have you basically limited your system resources and capabilities based on those roles using something called the principle of least privilege? Basically that every role you define should have the minimum amount of privilege required to fulfill the role. So if the role requires, you know, complete access to the system, that's fine, but you need to make sure that that role is very tightly controlled. And then passwords, right? And, you know, if your device uses passwords for access control, you know, what are the default usernames or passwords? I mean, you know, I got a, 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 a router for my house not that long ago that had a default username and password that was something like user and password. Um, if you build that kind of thing into your medical device and you don't somehow require it to be managed before the roles are unlocked, then you're opening yourself up to be exploited by the rest of the world. Lack of password management is a significant security hole in many devices. You'd be, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're always thinking about security, you would think that this is crazy. But I've seen many examples of people that really don't consider this at all. And that leads to a lot of problems. You know, and then other considerations, right? Can you can you securely boot your device? Is it protected from tampering? Right? You know, are you are you using the capabilities of your hardware to protect the device? There's a lot of good um, hardware security capabilities, but if they're not used, then they don't exist. And then encryption, you know, is your data encrypted? Is it secure? Is it secure at rest when it's in storage? Is it secure in use? And is it secure when it's transmitted to another device, right? Or are you just leaving that data out there so that it's easily snooped?
And then the thing about security and open source is that because the source is open, it's known to the worldwide community. And because the worldwide community doesn't include all good guys, but many, many good guys, and many, many good guys are thinking about security, many security vulnerabilities are, are found by people with good intent and are publicized to the world through something called Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, or CVEs. And it's a joint effort of Mitricorp and the National Vulnerability Database of the United States. And you should verify that no known CVEs are in your device before your release. Now, it doesn't mean that necessarily, well, that no known CVEs are in your device that might impact your device before the release. And there are tools that can help, especially if you're using open source. Uh, there are the CVE check tool. There are many other tools that are available, both commercial and open source that can basically correlate CVEs with the versions of open source modules that you're using and allow you to the review the results. We'll talk a little bit more about CVEs, but the real problem with CVEs is just the sheer number of them. There are hundreds of them identified every month, every, every week. Um, and, and keeping up with them is a bit of a problem, which we'll talk about a bit more. And then Basically, how are you going to keep your device secure? You know, the time to prepare is during design. How are you going to securely update your device, right? How often? How do you minimize downtime and protect user data while you're updating the device? It's really no longer acceptable to not update a network connected device unless, well, actually, there's very few instances where it's acceptable. So you need to understand how you're going to do these things. Yeah, because your device is probably going to have a lifespan measured in years or decades, right? If we're talking about, you know, an MRI device that costs uh, quite a bit of money, you know, it's going to be in use for a long time and downtime is expensive, right? It'll have defects when you release it that you don't know about today, right? No matter how much testing you do, no matter how much analysis you do, there's going to be defects. And if you're using third-party software, it'll have vulnerabilities, right? And it's not, and they won't be known to the community when you release them. So, so that is what drives those needs up above. Basically, these things are going to happen. Be ready for them and be prepared to do something about them. So let's go back to vulnerability monitoring. You know, I talked about these CVEs. There's actually about 300 CVEs identified every single week. Now, most of them won't be applicable to your device, right? You know, um, they might be used against older versions of the open source modules that you're using. They might be, uh, they might only be applicable to certain uh, uh, targets or certain chips that you might be using. Um, you know, but you need to figure out which CVEs might apply, affect you. And then because these introduce risk, you need to do impact analyses to determine whether or not they're important. I right? need to look at every one of them. And most of them will just be, oh, no, nope, I'm using a later version. Oh, no, nope, that's not my target. No, nope, no, nope, whatever, whatever, whatever. But some of them will be applicable. And then you need to find the patches for those CVEs if you're using Linux or other open source. Now, Linux, the Linux community is very, very good about providing these patches, right? And they sometimes support previous releases through like the Yocto and Debian projects, right? But then, how do you handle your CVE patches if the community no longer supports the version that you're using, right? That basically means you need to do the backport fix and maintenance yourself, right? And then you need to constantly monitor, right? 300 every week. So you need to constantly be looking at these things. And then as above, you need to think about how you're going to do these updates because your customers are not going to be satisfied if you're not going to be... Um, uh, taking care of issues within a reasonable amount of time once they're disclosed. So let's talk a little bit about managing Linux, right? If, let's say I've gone through this whole thing and I'm going, yep, Linux is for me. It provides a lot of capabilities. It has, um, you know, AI and, and graphical and other capabilities in modules that are designed to run with Linux that I need, right? So then, well, what Linux should I use? Well, you know, there's the Octo project. I can go and download it. It's actively developed. It's got good documentation. It's easy to customize. You know, I can use Debian. Now, Debian is traditionally an enterprise class OS, but it has been 
you know, basically is moving more and more towards embedded applications because the concept of Debian, where there is just a, a, a binary out there that basically provides me all of the capability that I need and I don't have to manage how do I get to that binary is useful to a lot of people, right? So Debian is becoming more and more important in the embedded world and more and more medical devices are at least considering Debian offerings um, as, as kind of the building blocks of their device. And then there are older things like BuildRoot um, and then there are commercial solutions. You know, uh, we have one, our competitors have them. You know, there are a lot of commercial Linux solutions out there. So there's the Octo project. I'm not going to go into this. Um, it basically talks about how one goes about, you know, um, um, using and building the Octo project. You know, Debian started out as an enterprise Linux OS in 1993. If you've ever used Ubuntu, you're using Debian. There are many, many, many other considerations, and there's a lot of documentation out there about Debian. And I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail. But the thing that you need to think about is how are you going to manage and support your solution, right? You know, you have to, this, you know, in using embedded Linux and all of those other modules, uh, that's millions and millions of lines of code, development tools, tool chains, everything, right? How are you going to keep teams from creating too many variants? It's very easy for uh, uh, an organization that is working on four different devices, uh, each of which in a silo, ending up with four different Linux distributions um, that have been modified in a way that the source of the changes that have been made can't be accepted by the community and have to be maintained by themselves. Um, you know, how do you manage the licenses? How are you going to test it? How are you going to support it, right? The community provides support for about two years, right, for a, for, for a non-long, you know, long-life version of, uh, of an operating system or of a module. Uh, but like I said, a lot of these devices have lifetimes that go way beyond that. Right? And how do you maintain it for the life of a product? It gets, the cost of maintenance gets pretty high, pretty fast, if you don't think about it up front. So what do I do, right? Well, I need to define processes up front and ensure they're followed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it don't over branch, right? Make sure you have a support plan in place, right? How are you gonna handle those bugs that we talked about? How are you gonna monitor the community for vulnerabilities? How are you gonna update your product? right? Train and enable your team to, to do the right thing. So before I finish, I'll just talk a little, just, just briefly about what we do at Siemens Embedded, right? We have two different Siemens, uh, Linux distributions, as I meant, kind of implied before, one based on the Octo project, one based on Debian. You know, we, we support graphics enablement, we support broad processor support. We support AI and machine learning. We support CVE monitoring. We can do it for you. Um, we can we can target um, either of those Linux distributions to your device, right? We can help you. We can either solve for you, or help you solve a lot of the problems that we talked about during the course of this presentation. And like I said, I'm not going to get into it a whole lot, but if um, if you're interested, you know, you have my contact information. Feel free. So in summary, risk management is essential when developing medical devices. That has nothing really to do with Linux per se or with open source software per se, but it's just kind of everything that we do. And then the use of soup can help reduce risk, but it kind of adds things to be considered. So you need to consider those things, right? Linux is good for a lot of things, right? Other open source modules are good for a lot of things, but there are still valid reasons for using an RTOS or bare metal in some cases. And you need to think about those up front, right? Don't make the decision to go to, in a certain direction before you've thought about, you know, kind of more deeply what your device is going to look like. Don't let your open source get out of control, right? Managing Linux and tools is not a simple task. And so, Think about it up front, because if you don't think about it up front, it's going to um, hurt you later on. You know, security, never forget about security. Follow a standard, define your risks, and have a plan in place to address vulnerabilities. You know, I talk to a lot of people who come from the academic world, and they have a great idea for an advancement that will help the world 
um, you know, through the creation of some kind of new medical device. And they, and they don't think about security and it ends up hurting them at the end because then when they try to go and sell their device, either to a larger medical device manufacturer or on their own, they have no way to get it approved, right? But the key point here is Linux is used in safety certified devices today, right? It's pretty heavily used in those devices today. Define your risks, follow certification guidelines, consider going with a commercial vendor. All of those things will make your life easier as you go through your regulatory process. So if there are any questions, otherwise, thank you very much. My name is Robert Bates and um, as I said, I'll take questions now.